James Monroe was an American statesman who served from 1817 to 1825 as the fifth president of the United States. Monroe was the last president among the founding fathers of the United States as well as the Virginian dynasty. He also represented the end of the Republican generation in that office. Born in Westmoreland County, Virginia, Monroe was of the planter class and fought in the American Revolutionary War. He was wounded in the Battle of Trenton with a musket ball to his shoulder. After studying law under Thomas Jefferson from 1780 to 1783, he served as a delegate in the Continental Congress. As an anti-federalist delegate to the Virginia Convention that considered ratification of the United States Constitution, Monroe opposed ratification, claiming it gave too much power to the central government. He took an active part in the new government, and in 1790 he was elected to the Senate of the first United States Congress, where he joined the Democratic-Republicans. He gained experience as an executive as the governor of Virginia and rose to national prominence as a diplomat in France. When he helped negotiate the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, during the War of 1812, Monroe served in critical roles as Secretary of State and as Secretary of War under President James Madison. Facing little opposition from the fractured Federalist Party, Monroe was easily elected President in 1816, winning over 80% of the electoral vote and becoming the last President during the first party system era of American politics. As president, he sought to ease partisan tensions, embarking on a tour of the country that was well received. With the ratification of the Treaty of 1818, under the successful diplomacy of his Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, the United States extended its reach from the Atlantic to the Pacific. By acquiring harbor and fishing rights in the Pacific Northwest, the United States and Britain jointly occupied the Oregon country. In addition to the acquisition of Florida, the 1819 adams onis Treaty secured the border of the United States along the 42nd parallel to the Pacific Ocean, and represented America's first determined attempt at creating an American global empire. As nationalism surged, partisan fury subsided, and the era of good feelings ensued until the Panic of 1819 struck, and a dispute over the admission of Missouri embroiled the country in 1820. Nonetheless, Monroe won near-unanimous re-election. Monroe supported the founding of colonies in Africa for freed slaves that would eventually form the nation of Liberia, whose capital, Monrovia, is named in his honor. In 1823, he announced the United States' opposition to any European intervention in the recently independent countries of the Americas with the Monroe Doctrine, which became a landmark in American foreign policy. His presidency concluded the first period of American presidential history before the beginning of Jacksonian democracy in the Second Party System era. Following his retirement in 1825, Monroe was plagued by financial difficulties. He died in New York City on July 4, 1831. He has been ranked in the aggregate by scholars as the 16th most successful president. Early Life James Monroe was born on April 28, 1758, in his parents' house located in a wooded area of Westmoreland County, Virginia. The marked site is one mile from the unincorporated community known today as Monroe Hall, Virginia. The James Monroe family home site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. His father Spence Monroe was a moderately prosperous planter who also practiced carpentry. His mother Elizabeth Jones married Spence Monroe in 1752 and they had several children. His paternal great-grandfather Patrick Andrew Monroe emigrated to America from Scotland in the mid-17th century. In 1650 he patented a large tract of land in Washington Parish, Westmoreland County, Virginia. Also among James Monroe's ancestors were French Huguenot immigrants, 
who came to Virginia in 1700. Education First tutored at home by his mother Elizabeth, between the ages of 11 and 16, the young Monroe studied at Campbelltown Academy, a school run by Reverend Archibald Campbell of Washington Parish. There he excelled as a pupil and progressed through Latin and mathematics faster than most boys. His age, John Marshall, later Chief Justice of the United States, was among his classmates. Upon the death of his father in 1774, Monroe inherited his small plantation and slaves, officially joining the ruling class of planter slaveholders of Virginia. Revolutionary War Service In early 1776, about a year and a half after his enrollment, Monroe dropped out of college and joined the 3rd Virginia Regiment, established December 28. 1775, in the Continental Army where his background as a college student and son of a well-known planter, enabled him to obtain an officer's commission. He never returned to earn a degree. John Trumbull painted the capture of the Hessians at Trenton, December 26, 1776 showing Captain William Washington, with wounded hand, on the right and LT, Monroe, severely wounded and helped by Dr. Riker, left of center. Although Andrew Jackson served as a courier in a militia unit at age 13, Monroe is regarded as the last U.S. president who was a Revolutionary War veteran. Since he served as an officer of the Continental Army and took part in combat with the rest of General George Washington's army, Following its defeat at the Battle of Long Island on August 27, Monroe's regiment was chased off of Long Island in the fall of 1776 and down the length of New Jersey crossing the Delaware River in December 1776. Down to mere days before their enlistments expired, Washington decided that only a bold step could save the army in the revolutionary cause from oblivion. Washington ordered his force, that had shrunk 90% since the Battle of Long Island, down to under 3,000 effective soldiers, to cross the Delaware River on the evening of December 25 and attack a detachment of Hessian soldiers on the morning of December 26, thus leading to the Battle of Trenton. Monroe and his regiment crossed over and marched through an nor'easter snowstorm north and then east towards Trenton. Along the way, the soldiers were spotted by a young patriot doctor, John Riker, whose dogs had been awakened in the pre-dawn early morning. Riker volunteered to lend his medical bag to the efforts saying that as many doctors as possible would be needed fearing severe casualties from a clash with the battle-tested Hessian professional. Mercenary soldiers of Germany, avoiding detection, the Americans approached the center of Trenton from north and south. When the Hessians sounded the alarm, they tried to get several of their artillery pieces in action to pour grape shot into the Americans, marching down towards the homes they had commandeered, knowing that this would slow the assault. After a volley of artillery fire, Lt. Monroe and Gen. Washington's cousin, Captain William Washington and their men rushed to seize the guns before they could fire. Both young officers were severely wounded. Captain Washington was badly wounded in both hands, and young Lieutenant James Monroe was carried from the field bleeding badly after he was struck in the left shoulder by a musket ball, which severed an artery. It would be the young volunteer doctor, John Riker, who clamped the artery keeping him from bleeding to death and saving his life. After recuperating from his wound, he was appointed lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia, and tasked to recruit and lead a regiment, but the regiment was never raised. He returned to Williamsburg in September 1779 and studied law with George Wythe, then moved to Richmond to study law with Thomas Jefferson. In 1780 the British invaded Richmond, and as governor, Jefferson commissioned Monroe as a colonel to command the militia raised in response and act as liaison to the Continental Army in North Carolina.
Monroe resumed studying law under Thomas Jefferson, and continued until 1783. Marriage and Family Eliza Courtright Monroe Hay Eliza was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, in 1786, and was educated in Paris at the school of Madame Campin during the time her father was the United States Ambassador to France. In 1808 she married George Hay, a prominent Virginia attorney who had served as prosecutor in the trial of Aaron Burr and later U.S. District Judge Maria Hester Monroe, married her cousin Samuel L. Governor on March 8, 1820, in the first wedding of a president's child in the White House. Plantations and Slavery Monroe sold his small inherited Virginia plantation in 1783 to enter law and politics. He later fulfilled his youthful dream of becoming the owner of a large plantation and wielding great political power, but his plantation was never profitable. Although he owned much more land and many more slaves, and speculated in property, he was rarely on site to oversee the operations. Overseers treated the slaves harshly to force production, but the plantations barely broke even. Monroe incurred debts by his lavish and expensive lifestyle and often sold property, including slaves, to pay them off. Early Political Career Virginia Politics Monroe was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in 1782, after serving on Virginia's Executive Council. In 1786, Monroe won election to another term in the Virginia House of Delegates, and in 1788 he became a delegate to the Virginia Constitutional Ratification Convention. Monroe ran for a House seat to represent Virginia in the first Congress against Madison. Though the two remained on good term, Monroe pressed for a Bill of Rights, while Madison supported the Constitution as written. In 1790, he was elected by the Virginia Legislature as one of the state's two United States Senators. He became an important lieutenant to Jefferson and Madison who founded the Democratic-Republican faction in opposition to Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton's policies, which included a national bank and federal assumption of state debt. Emerging as a leader of the Senate Democratic-Republicans, Monroe continued to champion Western expansionism and became a prominent supporter of close ties with France. Ambassador to France in 1794, Monroe resigned his Senate seat after President Washington appointed him as Minister to France. Washington hoped that the appointment of Monroe, a strong supporter of France and the French Revolution, would strengthen relations between France and the United States. Months Monroe arrived in France, the U.S. and Great Britain concluded the Jay Treaty, outraging both the French who were at war with the British, and Monroe, who had not been fully informed about the treaty prior to its publication. Despite the deleterious effects of the Jay Treaty on Franco-American relations, Monroe won French support for U.S. navigational rights on the Mississippi River, the mouth of which was controlled by Spain, and in 1795 the U.S. and Spain signed Pinckney's Treaty. The treaty granted the U.S. limited rights to use the port of New Orleans. Monroe arranged to free all the Americans held in French prisons. Among those he secured the release of was Thomas Paine, who was arrested for opposition to the execution of Louis XVI. The government insisted that Paine be deported to the United States. Frustrated by Monroe's inability to convince the French of the benign nature of the Jay Treaty, Washington recalled Monroe in November 1796. He returned to the United States, where he wrote a 400-page defense of his tenure as ambassador, criticizing Washington's desire to pursue closer relations with Britain at the expense of relations with France. Governor of Virginia and Diplomat out of office, Monroe returned to practicing law in Virginia until elected governor there as a Democratic-Republican. 
His first term serving from 1799 to 1802, he was re-elected Virginia's governor in 1811. Shortly after the end of Monroe's gubernatorial tenure, President Jefferson sent Monroe back to France to assist Ambassador Robert R. Livingston in negotiating the Louisiana Purchase. While Livingston originally only sought to acquire New Orleans, which France had acquired in the 1800 Treaty of San Ildefonso, Monroe and Livingston accepted Napoleon's offer to buy the entire Louisiana Territory. Monroe also tried to buy East Florida and West Florida from Spain, but numerous U.S. Spanish territorial disputes and a lack of support from France made the Spanish unwilling to sell the territories. Monroe served as minister to the court of St. James's from 1803 to 1807. In 1806 he negotiated a treaty with Great Britain, known as the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty. It would have extended the Jay Treaty of 1794 which had expired after 10 years. Jefferson had fought the Jay Treaty intensely in 1794, 95 because he felt it would allow the British to subvert American republicanism. The treaty had produced 10 years of peace and highly lucrative trade for American merchants. But Jefferson was still hostile. When Monroe and the British signed a renewal in December 1806, Jefferson decided not to even submit it to the Senate for ratification. Although the new treaty called for 10 more years of trade between the United States and the British Empire and gave American merchants guarantees that would have been good for business, Jefferson refused to give up the potential weapon of commercial warfare against Britain and was unhappy that it did not end the hated British practice of impressment of American sailors. Jefferson did not attempt to obtain another treaty, and as a result, the two nations drifted from peace toward the War of 1812, 1808 election and the quids. The Democratic Republican Party was increasingly factionalized, with old Republicans, or quids, denouncing the Jefferson administration for abandoning true Republican principles, the quids. Seeing that Monroe's foreign policy had been rejected by Jefferson, tried to enlist Monroe in their cause. The plan was to run Monroe for president in the 1808 election in cooperation with the Federalist Party, which had a strong base in New England. John Randolph of Roanoke led the quid effort to stop Jefferson's choice of James Madison. However, the regular Democratic Republicans overcame the quids in the nominating caucus, kept control of the party in Virginia, and protected Madison's base. Monroe was not a candidate for president, and Madison was elected Secretary of State and Secretary of War. Monroe returned to the Virginia House of Burgesses and was elected to another term as governor in 1811, but served only four months. In April 1811, Madison appointed Monroe as Secretary of State in hopes of shoring up the support of the more radical factions of the Democratic-Republicans. Presidential Elections Election of 1816 The Congressional Nominating Caucus experienced little opposition during the administrations of Jefferson and Madison. But this situation changed in the election year of 1816. An indeterminate number of anti-Virginia Republicans, led by the New York delegation, objected to the caucus system along with the Federalists. This organization and failure to agree on William H. Crawford, Daniel Tompkins, Henry Clay or another possible contender weakened opposition to Monroe. The boycott by Virginia delegates of the March 12th caucus removed the chances of Monroe's opponents, and he received the caucus nomination four days later. Election of 1820 The collapse of the Federalists left Monroe with no organized opposition at the end of his first term, and he ran for re-election unopposed. Presidency Domestic Affairs Missouri Compromise In February 1819, 
a bill to enable the people of the Missouri Territory to draft a constitution and form a government preliminary to admission into the Union came before the House of Representatives for debate. During these proceedings, Congressman James Talmadge, Jr., of New York tossed a bombshell into the era of good feelings. The amendment instantly exposed the polarization among Jeffersonian Republicans over the future of slavery in the nation. During the following session, the House passed a similar bill with an amendment, introduced on January 26, 1820, by John W. Taylor of New York, allowing Missouri into the Union as a slave state. The question had been complicated by the admission in December of Alabama, a slave state, making the number of slave and free states equal. In addition, there was a bill in passage through the House to admit Maine as a free state. The two houses were at odds not only on the issue of the legality of slavery, but also on the parliamentary question of the inclusion of Maine and Missouri within the same bill. The committee recommended the enactment of two laws, one for the admission of Maine, the other an enabling act for Missouri. They recommended against having restrictions on slavery but for including the Thomas Amendment. Both houses agreed, and the measures were passed on March 5, 1820, and were signed by the President on March 6. The question of the final admission of Missouri came up during the session of 1820. 1821. The struggle was revived over a clause in Missouri's new constitution, written in 1820, requiring the exclusion of free Negroes and mulattoes from the state. Through the influence of Kentucky Senator Henry Clay, the Great Compromiser, an act of admission was finally passed, upon the condition that the exclusionary clause of the Missouri Constitution should never be construed to authorize the passage of any law impairing the privileges and immunities of any EU s citizen. This deliberately ambiguous provision is sometimes known as the Second Missouri Compromise. Internal Improvements As the United States continued to grow, many Americans advocated a system of internal improvements to help the country develop. Monroe thought this a good idea. He believed that the young nation needed an improved infrastructure, including a transportation network to grow and thrive economically. However, he did not think that the Constitution said anything about the authority to build, maintain, and operate a national transportation system. He therefore urged Congress to introduce a constitutional amendment granting it such power. Congress never acted on his suggestion because many legislators thought they already had the implied authority to enact such measures. In 1822, a bill to authorize the collection of tolls on the Cumberland Road, which provided for yearly improvements to the road, had been vetoed by the president. In an elaborate essay, Monroe set forth his views on the constitutional aspects of a policy of internal improvements. Congress my appropriate money, he admitted, but it might not undertake the actual construction of national works nor assume jurisdiction over them. For the moment, the drift toward a larger participation of the national government in internal improvements was stayed. Two years later, Congress authorized the president to institute surveys for such roads and canals as he believed to be needed for commerce and military defense. No one pleaded more eloquently for a larger conception of the functions of the national government than Henry Clay. He called the attention of his hearers to provisions made for coast surveys and lighthouses on the Atlantic seaboard and deplored the neglect of the interior of the country. Of the other presidential candidates, Jackson voted in the Senate for the General Survey Bill and Adams left no doubt in the public mind that he did not reflect the narrow views of his section. On this issue, Crawford felt the constitutional scruples which were everywhere being voiced in the South, and followed the old expedient of advocating a constitutional amendment to sanction national internal improvements. Foreign Affairs Bilateral Treaties Rush Bagot Treaty with Great Britain signed April 20, 
1817, regulated naval armaments on the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain, demilitarizing the border between the U.S. and British North America. Treaty of 1818 with Great Britain, signed October 20, 1818, fixed the present Canada. United States border from Minnesota to the Rocky Mountains at the 49th parallel. The Accords also established a joint U.S. British occupation of Oregon country for the next 10 years. Russo American Treaty of 1824 with Russia, signed April 17, 1824, set the southern limit of Russian sovereignty on the Pacific coast of North America at the 54. 40. Question mark parallel, the present southern tip of the Alaska Panhandle. Spanish Florida Spain had long rejected repeated American efforts to purchase Florida. But by 1818, Spain was facing a troubling colonial situation in which the cession of Florida made sense. Spain had been exhausted by the Peninsular War in Europe and needed to rebuild its credibility and presence in its colonies. Revolutionaries in Central America and South America were beginning to demand independence. Spain was unwilling to invest further in Florida, encroached on by American settlers, and it worried about the border between New Spain, a large area including today's Mexico, Central America, and much of the current U.S. Western states, and the United States, with minor military presence in Florida. Spain was not able to restrain the Seminole warriors who routinely crossed the border and raided American villages and farms, as well as protected southern slave refugees from slave owners and traders of the southern United States. To stop the Seminole Indians based in East Florida from raiding Georgia settlements and offering havens for runaway slaves, the U.S. Army led increasingly frequent incursions into Spanish territory. This included the 1817-1818 campaign led by General Andrew Jackson that became known as the First Seminole War. Jackson and a force of Tennessee militia, under federal orders, attacked Pensacola, and captured forts, such as St. Mark's, and the so-called Negro Fort an abandoned British fort manned by escaped slaves and Seminoles in Florida that he thought were assisting the raids into American territory. As a result, the U.S. effectively seized control of northeastern Florida, albeit for purposes of lawful government and administration, in the state of Georgia, but not for the outright annexation. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams said the U.S. had to take control because Florida along the border of Georgia and Alabama territory, had become a derelict open to the occupancy of every enemy, civilized or savage, of the United States, and serving no other earthly purpose than as a post of annoyance to them. The treaty became effective on February 22, 1821. Monroe Doctrine After the Napoleonic Wars, which ended in 1815, Almost all of Spain's and Portugal's colonies in Latin America revolted and declared independence. Americans welcomed this development as a validation of the spirit of republicanism. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams suggested delaying formal recognition until Florida was secured. The problem of imperial invasion was intensified by a Russian claim to the Pacific coast down to the 51st parallel and simultaneous European pressure to have all of Latin America returned to its colonial status. Monroe informed Congress in March 1822 that permanent stable governments had been established in the United Provinces of the River Plate, the core of present-day Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico. Adams, under Monroe's supervision, wrote the instructions for the ministers ambassadors to these new countries. They declared that the policy of the United States was to uphold Republican institutions and to seek treaties of commerce on a most favored nation basis. The United States would support inter-American congresses dedicated to the development of economic 
and political institutions fundamentally differing from those prevailing in Europe. The articulation of an American system, distinct from that of Europe, was a basic tenet of Monroe's policy toward Latin America. Monroe took pride as the United States was the first nation to extend recognition and to set an example to the rest of the world for its support of the cause of liberty and humanity. Monroe formally announced in his message to Congress on December 2, 1823, what was later called the Monroe Doctrine. He proclaimed that the Americas should be free from future European colonization and free from European interference in sovereign countries' affairs. It further stated the United States' intention to stay neutral in European wars and wars between European powers and their colonies, but to consider new colonies or interference with independent countries in the Americas as hostile acts toward the United States. Although it is Monroe's most famous contribution to history, the speech was written by Adams, who designed the doctrine in cooperation with Britain. The Monroe Doctrine at the time of its adoption thus pertained more to the Russians in North America than to the former Spanish colonies. The result was a system of American isolationism under the sponsorship of the British Navy. The Monroe Doctrine held that the United States considered the Western Hemisphere as no longer a place for European colonization, that any future effort to gain further political control in the hemisphere or to violate the independence of existing states would be treated as an act of hostility, and finally that there existed two different and incompatible political systems in the world. The United States, therefore, promised to refrain from intervention in European affairs and demanded Europe to abstain from interfering with American matters. There were few serious European attempts at intervention, administration and cabinet. Monroe made balanced cabinet choices, naming a southerner, John C. Calhoun, as Secretary of War, and a northerner, John Quincy Adams, as Secretary of State. Both proved outstanding. As Adams was a master diplomat Monroe decided on political grounds not to offer Henry Clay the State Department, and Clay turned down the War Department and remained Speaker of the House. So Monroe lacked an outstanding Westerner in his cabinet. Monroe was the only president in the 19th century to complete two full terms with the same vice president. Judicial Appointments Monroe appointed one justice to the Supreme Court of the United States, Smith Thompson. He appointed 21 other federal judges, all to United States District Courts, as no vacancies occurred on the one circuit court existing at the time. States admitted to the Union Maine is one of three states that were set off from already existing states. Kentucky and West Virginia are the others. The Massachusetts General Court passed enabling legislation on June 19, 1819 separating the District of Maine from the rest of the state, an action approved by the voters in Maine on July 19, 1819 by 17, 001 to 7, 132, then, on February 25, 1820, passed a follow-up measure officially accepting the fact of Maine's imminent statehood post-presidency. When his presidency ended on March 4, 1825, James Monroe resided at Monroe Hill, what is now included in the grounds of the University of Virginia. He had operated the family farm from 1788 to 1817, but sold it in the first year of his presidency to the new college. He served on the college's Board of Visitors under Jefferson and under the second rector James Madison, both former presidents, almost until his death. Monroe had racked up many debts during his years of public life. He sold off his Highland Plantation, now called Ashlawn Highland. It is now owned by his alma mater, the College of William and Mary, which has opened it to the public as a historic site. Throughout his life, he was not financially solvent, and his wife's poor health made matters worse.
Monroe was elected as a delegate to the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1829-1830. He had served in the previous convention of 1776 proclaiming Virginia's first state constitution. In 1829, he was elected by the convention to serve as the presiding officer, until his health required his replacement by Philip P. Barber of Orange County, he was one of four delegates elected from the senatorial district made up his home district of Loden and Fairfax County. He and his wife lived in Oak Hill, Virginia, until Elizabeth's death on September 23, 1830. In August 1825, the Monroes had received the Marquis de Lafayette and President John Quincy Adams as guests there. Death Upon Elizabeth's death in 1830, Monroe moved to New York City to live with his daughter Maria Hester Monroe Governor who had married Samuel L. Governor in the White House. Monroe's health began to slowly fail by the end of the 1820s and John Quincy Adams visited him there in April 1831. Adams found him alert and eager to discuss the situation in Europe, but in ill health. Adams cut the visit short when he thought he was tiring Monroe. Monroe died there from heart failure and tuberculosis on July 4, 1831, thus becoming the third president to have died on Independence Day. July 4, his death came 55 years after the U.S. Declaration of Independence was proclaimed and five years after the death of two other founding fathers who became presidents. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Monroe was originally buried in New York at the Governor family's vault in the New York City Marble Cemetery. 27 years later, in 1858, the body was reinterred to the President's Circle at the Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. The James Monroe Tomb is a U.S. National Historic Landmark. Religious Beliefs when it comes to Monroe's thoughts on religion. Bliss Isley notes, Less is known than that of any other president. No letters survive in which he discussed his religious beliefs, nor did his friends, family or associates comment on his beliefs. Letters that do survive, such as ones written after the death of his son, contain no discussion of religion. Monroe was raised in a family that belonged to the Church of England when it was the state church in Virginia before the Revolution. As an adult, he attended Episcopal churches. Some historians see deistic tendencies in his few references to an impersonal God. As Secretary of State, Monroe dismissed Mordecai Manuel Noah in 1815 from his post as consul to Tunis because he was Jewish. If we persevere, we cannot fail, under the favor of a gracious providence. My fervent prayers to the Almighty that he will be graciously pleased to continue to us that protection which he has already so conspicuously displayed in our favor. Quote. Slavery Monroe owned dozens of slaves. According to William Seal, he took several slaves with him to Washington to serve at the White House from 1817 to 1825. This was typical of other slaveholders. As Congress did not provide for domestic staff of the presidents at that time, on October 15, 1799, as some slave traders tried to transport a group of slaves from Southampton to Georgia, the slaves revolted and killed the traders. When Monroe was governor of Virginia in 1800, hundreds of slaves from Virginia planned to kidnap him, take Richmond, and negotiate for their freedom. Due to a storm on August 30th, they were unable to attack. What became known as Gabriel's slave conspiracy became public knowledge. In response, Governor Monroe called out the militia. The slave patrols soon captured some slaves accused of involvement. Sidbury says some trials had a few measures to prevent abuses, such as an appointed attorney, but they were, hardly, fair. Slave codes prevented slaves from being treated like whites, and they were given quick trials without a jury.
As president of Virginia's Constitutional Convention in the fall of 1829, Monroe reiterated his belief that slavery was a blight which, even as a British colony, Virginia had attempted to eradicate. What was the origin of our slave population? He rhetorically asked. The evil commenced when we were in our colonial state, but acts were passed by our colonial legislature, prohibiting the importation of more slaves into the colony. These were rejected by the Crown. To the dismay of states' rights proponents, he was willing to accept the federal government's financial assistance to emancipate and transport freed slaves to other countries. At the convention, Monroe made his final public statement on slavery, proposing that Virginia emancipate and deport its bondsmen with the aid of the Union. Quote, Monroe was part of the American Colonization Society, formed in 1816, the members of which included Henry Clay and Andrew Jackson. They found common ground with some abolitionists in supporting colonization. They helped send several thousand freed slaves to the new colony of Liberia in Africa from 1822. 1840. Slave owners like Monroe and Jackson wanted to prevent free blacks from encouraging slaves in the South to rebel, with about $100.000 in federal grant money. The organization also bought land for the freedmen in what is today Liberia. Honors and Memberships Legacy and Memory Since its 1824 renaming in his honor, the capital city of the West African country of Liberia has been named Monrovia. It is the only non-American capital city named after A.U.S. President. On December 12, 1954, the United States Postal Service released a 5. Question mark, Liberty issue postage stamp honoring Monroe. There are academic buildings named after him at the University of Mary Washington, College of William and Mary, George Mason University, and George Washington University. In addition, a statue of Monroe was dedicated in front of Tucker Hall on the campus of William and Mary in 2015. The cities of Monroe, Michigan and Monroe, Georgia, incorporated in 1821, and Monroe, Connecticut, incorporated in 1823, are named for him. James Monroe Park located on Pennsylvania Avenue, between 20th and I Streets, and W in Washington, D. C. is dedicated in his honor. Monroe was the last U.S. president to wear a powdered wig tied in a queue. A tricorn hat and knee breeches according to the style of the late 18th century. Monroe is the last president neither to have been photographed nor to have had a photographed predecessor. His portraits are preserved today only on paintings.